Okay, good afternoon, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to our session. Um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm quite lucky to be able to present uh, something approximating the final results of one of our projects, um, the, one of the projects that Anne mentioned previously under the, the banner of the Scottish Wetland Archaeology Programme. Um, we're coming towards the end of our research at the Cult, on the Cults Landscape Project, which was uh, one of the first major initiatives of, of the Scottish Wetland Programme in its, in its most recent incarnation. Um, so really what I want to do is kind of give you just quite a brief overview of the archaeology that we've been dealing with, the kind of sites we've been looking at and the results of them, but to fit them into this general theme that we have about exploring issues of, uh, of motivation, why, why we have panels in this country and, and, and what the, the meanings of them might be. But also in, in, integral to all of this is, are, are the kind of things that we're able, being able to make quite significant breakthroughs in which are, are to do with duration and issues of dating and this kind of thing. So, just put it in a bit of context then, when we started working on this program uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, this was in the, in the context of, of wetland archaeology generally being uh, thought about in terms of its position within the wider uh, archaeological context that it relates to. Okay? So, uh, in the words of John Coles, it's very commonly uh, offered that wetland archaeology puts flesh on the bones of prehistory. But we had the familiar problem in Scotland where we were unsure how does, how does wetland archaeology fit in, what does it tell us about the bigger picture, uh, and, and what can we take from that. And this, around about the time that, that people like Aidan O'Sullivan and Robert Van der Noort, um, were writing about, about putting uh, wetland archaeology back into its appropriate context and, and rethinking its position, the question that faced us at that point then was really how does the wetland evidence that we can take from Scotland uh, fit into our wider knowledge. So our, our key uh, study area, the one that I'll be speaking about today, uh, was at Cults Lock in southwest Scotland, as I already mentioned earlier, where he was working alongside us. Um, very small kettle hole lock, quite typical of the southwest lowlands of Scotland, um, but situated in a very dense, uh, densely populated later prehistoric landscape, so lots of contemporary archaeology around about. Mostly, it has to be said, in the form of, uh, of dryland uh, crop mark archaeology, so, so not the kind of uh, stuff that we're dealing with in Cranons. Um, so this was quite an ideal place for us to look at, at, at putting uh, the wetland archaeology into its, into its regional context, and very much in an area that up until this point had been quite anonymous in archaeological narratives of Iron Age Scotland. So, so a, an area known to be rich, but very poorly understood, very heterogeneous in, in, its, uh, in its character, uh, and very little handle on the dating and nature of these settlements. So this is Cults Loch then. Um, uh, you can see uh, uh, just a small section of the, the quite rich crop mark landscape surrounding it, um, and the sites that, that we looked at uh, as part of the project. Now the site, the wetland site itself, first attracted our attention during a kind of systematic overview of the wetland resource in the country. Uh, and the reason for this was that it has a fairly early radiocarbon date, so very, very early, so possibly on the, the, the Iron Age, Bronze, the Bronze Age, Iron Age transition. Um, and for that reason, we wondered whether we might be dealing with something very early in the Cranog sequence. So it was flagged up as a, as a site of interest for that reason alone. But also we thought it might relate to something almost unique in Scotland, which is a lock site settlement. And we were thinking along the lines of things like sites like Cullihanna and Clumfinlock, which are known from the, the Bronze Age in, in Ireland, but previously uh, unrecorded in Scotland. So we thought this was something different, but something with potential to, to, to contribute to a lot of our research themes. And so this was the site that was chosen for further work. So during the excavation then, the wetland excavation, just to run through the, the sequence, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the actual archaeology itself before turning to, to discuss some of the themes re resulting from it, but it quickly became apparent to us that we weren't dealing with a, a, a log site settlement and that the, the Cranog, as we came to refer to it, uh, was a purely artificial platform, so something much more akin to a, a conventional um, artificial island. So although the, the site was located on a, a natural PC mound in the loch, it had been very much enhanced by dumping logs, stones, peat, and this kind of thing onto, onto this mound uh, to create a platform for occupation. And this is all pinned together with, uh, with lots of vertical posts, so the, the kind of thing that, that you expect to find on a panel. This came with its own uh, complications and, and some certain challenges for the excavation, um, the most uh, pressing of which was, was this issue where whereby the, the stakes which related to superstructure, to the buildings built on top of the site, were more or less indistinguishable in, their, uh, in, in the way that they were preserved at the surface um, from those which pinned the, uh, the mound together. So this caused us all sorts of difficulties in, in, in actually figuring out the, um, the, the nature of the buildings that we were dealing with. And it has to be said that a lot of, uh, of the evidence we've been able to draw together has come through the systematic post-excavation program. Um, so it wasn't the easiest site to deal with. And the, 
decay, the decay trajectory, which is illustrated by the image on the right there, um, whereby the, the piles that hold the site together would, would slowly decay and fall over, almost to look like horizontal timbers, made things uh, somewhat challenging. Um, so it's been a process of, of pulling the evidence together, which is, uh, has brought us to the picture that we have of the site now. But it's fairly clear that what we're dealing with um, is a, a uh, something akin to a traditionally defined Cranog, that's a packwork mound um, whereby uh, materials dumped onto this mound and then the buildings built on top. And we've identified a sequence of at least three buildings, probably uh, probably more, um, the, the later of which uh, don't survive um, to an extent that we can identify them. But the, the earlier buildings uh, are, are quite clear to us now from, um, from the work we've been able to do in post-excavation stages. Although the it looks like the Cranog was, uh, was probably defined. There was evidence for, uh, for interior and exterior areas. There was a causeway which linked it, a really short causeway which linked it to the shore, uh, just a, a few meters long. There was nothing formal in terms of an enclosure uh, defining the living space, so nothing along the lines of Boston, if you're familiar with the, the early historic site in, in Ayrshire. And we think that it may be much more uh, lightweight in terms of its enclosure, probably something uh, like a, a wattle fence. Um, there was uh, substantial amounts of charcoal from around the perimeter site, all roundwoods, uh, hazel and, uh, and, um, and willow roundwoods, which would suggest the burning of, of something which may have formed the uh, uh, an external uh, enclosure. Um, we also have evidence for, in the only area of, of definitive upstanding archaeology on the site, um, for this kind of fence structure which may have defined um, areas for dumping, outside of which we found lots of, uh, of redeposited hearth and, and occupation debris and inside of which uh, were the living spaces. The buildings themselves uh, were again quite odd things to, uh, to excavate, very little in the way of, of upstanding superstructure, but it seems that the pattern in how these, these things were constructed was the dumping of inorganic uh, gravels, sands and gravels, uh, to form a dry and fireproof uh, base for, uh, for the building. Uh, onto which uh, were piled roundwoods, uh, horizontal timbers, uh, to define a floor surface, uh, uh, making a, a kind of subfloor structure, onto which things like reeds and uh, uh, some bracken and other uh, plant litter material was dumped as, as soft flooring. Uh, the hearths in these buildings uh, were, were constructed by um, defining areas using uh, uh, timbers and, and logs, and again dumping gravel, sand and gravel onto these, uh, to create these hearth bases. And these are very much the focal points of, of the building. And this is structure one, the earlier uh, of the buildings uh, on site. The flooring in these uh, buildings is very well preserved, and, uh, and the information that we've been able to, uh, to uh, extract from these deposits has, has been really quite rich. And this is, it's almost been defining the extents of the floorings on, on the site that, that we've been able to plot the extents of the buildings. Um, so, as I say, plant litter, uh, uh, leaves, bracken, and reeds um, being dumped as flooring material onto the site. Um, and through analysis of the intersection of these, uh, we've been, been able to identify multiple periods of, of reflooring, uh, of cleaning, and uh, reoccupation uh, of the site. And again, uh, these, these deposits have, have been very rich in terms of insect remains and also for evidence of, of other structural components that weren't directly um, identifiable on site. So there's evidence for cutting of turves, peat and peat, uh, to use as, as superstructural material, and that simply didn't survive. So structure two then, the best preserved of, of the buildings on site. Again, uh, the hearth very much the focus of the building, um, forming some, uh, 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 almost certainly a, a round structure, approximately round structure, around about 11 metres in diameter. Um, and again, a very similar sequence of construction, rounded logs uh, uh, laid as a subflooring material, uh, onto which um, soft flooring and sands and gravels to, produce, uh, uh, to create a fireproof, fireproof surface on, uh, within the building. Um, so it's, it's, it was interesting, the excavation of structure two, and that there were certain areas that looked like they'd been used for certain purposes. Some areas had gravel floors and others didn't. And again, within these gravel floors, uh, lots of evidence for cleaning, refurbishment, sweeping out of, of, of old uh, floor surfaces, and relaying of, of, of new. And on at least one occasion, it was, it was possible to identify a period of possible flooding. Um, it looks as though slumping was always a problem on this site, as we may have anticipated. Um, and the, the re-leveling using logs uh, and the reinsertion of, of upright timbers um, uh, in, in secondary phases of, of, act of activity were identifiable. Again, the hearth uh, forming the kind of central focus of this building seems to be uh, along the same lines as in structure one, uh, built by defining almost, almost a box uh, to retain uh, a core of sands and gravel, which forms the, the, uh, the basis for a hearth. And this is probably lined with, 
uh, with hearth stones. Um, so again, um, this is uh, quite a, a large and, and fairly complex structure that, which forms the focal point of, of the building. And it's interesting to look at these structures in the light of, of our discoveries at Black Loch, which um, Anne will be talking about later on. Again, uh, quite substantial chunky hearths are the, the focal point of the building. The excavation of the lower levels of the building gave us uh, uh, the, the richest deposits in terms of artifactual material. Um, but interestingly, the character of these uh, is such that we start to wonder about whether these are casual losses. In fact, uh, our, our interpretation is that, uh, is that these artifacts, these objects, have been placed under the floors um, as conscious uh, and deposits. Uh, they almost have the character of blessing deposits, foundation deposits before, um, uh, before occupation. And it's interesting to note that they, they all, in some way or another, re relate to, uh, uh, to production or to, or to food storage um, or possibly consumption. So things like vessels, uh, we have that, the, the, the wooden box there, and the ard, um, an ard point, so this early form of plough coming from directly beneath the floor surface uh, in structure one. Um, so there almost there's a there's a theme of kind of, uh, of productivity and food um, relating to these these objects which are placed below the floor. So we'll come back to the, the significance of those in in a moment. In artifactual terms, then there's very little to distinguish this settlement from um, from any other Iron Age uh, uh, settlement in in south of Scotland. We have got a wide range of core stone tools, both with evidence for both grain and uh, hide preparation. Uh, the usual saddle querns in abundance. We have jewellery, including uh, evidence for manufacture of camel coal uh, uh, bracelets. Quite an extensive flint assemblage, uh, which uh, complements the, 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 the large amount of evidence for iron tools on site in the form of, um, of tool marks on the timbers themselves. And of course, the art, which is quite a, a tangible connection um, for the, the occupying community to the, the farming of the landscape uh, in the immediate vicinity. So what's interesting about this art is that um, this, it's, the, it's the main share of one of these uh, composite bow arts. Um, uh, they're depicted in several instances in, in continental European um, Iron Age art, but, um, but quite striking in the fact that it's so similar to, uh, to the one from Milton Loch. Uh, Milton Loch being the only substantially excavated uh, <coughs> earlier Iron Age Carnog um, from southwest Scotland prior to the, the swap program here. So, Quite a, quite a significant find, and, and the, the fact that it's so similar and it, it concurs so closely with the, the fine circumstances of the Milton Lockhart that it must be one of the, the few instances of, of, of the recurrence of, of, of a ritual or votive, votive act in early Iron Age Scotland. Turning to the chronology of the site, this is the radiocarbon dating, um, quite limited in, in its extent, and it's, it's, I'm not going to talk too much about it other than to note that it's generally unhelpful uh, in understanding the chronology, and our, uh, typically for our, our Iron Age, uh, earlier Iron Age period, it falls right in that nasty uh, calibration plateau in the 600-400 area. Um, so um, not, not too helpful in terms of working out the, the internal chronology of the site, uh, other than to note its relationship to the, the dendrochronology, which has been much more useful. And this is probably the area where we've been, been able to make the biggest strides in, uh, forward in, in wetland research in Scotland in recent years. Uh, up until now, uh, it's been, uh, there have been no prehistoric uh, dendrochronology dates from Scotland at all. So this is a, is a fairly major advance, this breakthrough in, in, in obtaining these for southwest Scotland, uh, down largely to, uh, to Anne's work. So what it tells us is that we have a, 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 series of, a sequence of five uh, activity uh, episodes uh, going from the construction of the Cranog Mound uh, through at least three building phases up into the decay horizon. Um, but the important thing to note is that this, all of this activity occurs over uh, what's almost certainly a span of just a few decades, almost certainly in the, in the latter half of the 5th century BC. So lots of, lots of evidence for activity, rebuilding, abandonment and reoccupation of the site, um, but all occurring over quite a, a short time scale. Um, I, I will just uh, flag up before anyone brings up in, in the discussion this late date here, which relates to a pile from the causeway, which was uh, evidently refurbished in the, in the second century BC, but to which no other evidence relates at all on site. So it looks like a fairly casual and late um, phase of activity on the site. So I mentioned then that the, the aim was to understand uh, the, the, the position of the site in the wider landscape. So uh, it was our, we looked at the, the sites surrounding uh, Culp's Lock as well. So carried out excavations that is quite unusual promontory for um, on the south side of the lock. So uh, excavations there, again, I'm not going to be able to go into any detail here other than to say that there was evidence for, for activity from both Neolithic Bronze Age context, but a major phase of landscape landscaping happened, an enclosure, including the, the construction of of several uh, quite substantial banks and ditches in, in, in the mid, uh, probably in the, around the, the middle of the first millennium BC, 
um, around about the, the fifth century. So again, this is falling into exactly the same sort of period. Uh, some modeling by our colleagues at CERC of the radiocarbon dates have shown us that, um, that the activity at the, the promontory fort uh, overlaps, certainly overlaps with activity at the Cranham. Again, the other site on the north side of the loch, the palisaded enclosure. Um, I won't say too much about the archaeology there, other than to note that there's a sequence uh, of enclosure and several or phases of activity, but separated uh, by, by at least a couple of centuries of, of abandonment. So we have one phase of construction of enclosure, uh, and the building of a roundhouse in the centre of the site, and then after a hiatus of probably at least a couple of hundred years, uh, the construction of something very similar um, uh, on the site uh, following that phase of abandonment. So again, uh, modelling the radiocarbon dates allows us to kind of narrow down these, these phases of activity and place uh, these, these uh, activity phases uh, both before and after uh, the use of the cranog uh, in, the, in the chronology of the landscape. So turning then back around to our question about what's going on um, and how does how do Cranogs fit into this uh, this wider landscape uh, in southwest Scotland? It's interesting to note that the, it's instructive the chronology of the site on the on the Cranog itself and that it compresses down to such a short period of time. Um, what's what's uh, interesting in in the wider picture is how the radiocarbon dates that we've always relied on in the past have this hugely smeared effect across the landscape and. Uh, across, uh, through time, rather, and so the, the periods that we're able to identify must relate to very uh, discrete and quite limited pulses within this chronology. So, just to illustrate where the the, the, the cults' uh, uh, dendrochronological dates fit into the, the sphere of landscape and chronology that we otherwise rely on, and this is kind of allowing us to look again at the at the bigger picture patterns of, of what we know about Iron Age settlement in southwest Scotland and southern Scotland more generally. Uh, and it's this idea of very long durations of activity happening over centuries, but probably in the form of pulses of, of quite short-lived uh, phases of construction, abandonment and reoccupation. Sites like uh, Bray Head, where Claire Ellis was able to talk about seasonality of abandonment and, and reoccupation of the site over time. And most recently in, uh, in South East Scotland, when uh, Ar Arm and Mackenzie have discussed the uh, the phase of, of monumental enclosure that, that these sites often enter in, in the, around about the, the 5th century BC. So all of this then, coming back to our, our, our evidence for Cranog constru construction at Eckhouse Law, falling right into this period where there seems to be a huge amount of change in the early Iron Age settlement pattern. And we have this recurrent uh, theme of, uh, uh, of subfloor deposits so relating to productivity. The, the construction of sites like Eckhouse uh, Law are, are uh, perhaps could be seen in, in terms of this period of insecurity. It seems like a, it's, um, it's almost a plea for security and control over an environment um, that was maybe beyond the, um, beyond the inhabitants uh, otherwise. Um, and fitting into this idea of, uh, of the settlement landscape being very fixed, very durable, um, but for individual phases to be intermittent and, uh, and, and repeated. So these are the, the themes that we're be, being able to explore in meaningful ways then. And, as Anne, when Anne talks about Black Loch later on today, uh, we'll see that some of the, the questions that we're being able to ask about the duration of occupation, about the nature of, uh, of the use and, uh, uh, and construction of these uh, settlements, that are being able to answer in much more high resolution, much more meaningful ways uh, than ever before. And just as a little teaser and a lead into Anne's talk, it's perhaps just worth saying that it's interesting that it's in perhaps one of the areas of Scotland that's been so anonymous in the past uh, in terms of Iron Age archaeology up until now that we're, we're being able to approach some of these uh, more meaningful questions. I'd better leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.